we're all waiting for here. I want to introduce our speaker for visualizing a billion data points. His name is Dr. Carlos Scheidegger, and he's an assistant professor at the University of Arizona in the Department of Computer Science. He received his PhD in computing from the University of Utah. His current research interests are in large-scale data analysis, information visualization, and a little more broadly, what happens when people meet data. His work has been honored with several Best Paper Awards and nominations, as well as an IBM Student Fellowship. He has been with the U of A since 2014, and he's currently an assistant professor, as I said. And uh, interesting facts about Dr. Scheidegger is he was born and raised in Brazil and has a very adorable doggy. So with that in mind, tonight Carlos will present live demos of visualization techniques on a variety of real world data sets. And most of you have probably heard about one of the big ones we'll be talking about tonight, Southwest Airlines. So without further ado, put your hands together for Dr. Carlos Scheidegger. Hello. I guess you can all hear me, right? OK. If, if I get too loud, please yell at me. Um, thank you very much for having me. This is very exciting. Um, thanks, Barbara, for the introduction. Um, as she said, I'm an assistant professor um, at the Department of Computer Science. Um, I guess she didn't say that my hobby is worrying about tenure. Uh, so <laughs> what? I'm going to be telling you today is a story about how do we make sense of our data when uh, it is so large that it's even hard to think about. So let me just give you a little context about sort of just how uh, big of a problem and of a, an opportunity we have right now. So this, is, this slide is now about five years old, but it will give you sort of just the idea of how, uh, how big of a pickle we're in. Um, so. All the way in the bottom here, right? So the green line in the bottom is sort of, you know, the amount of data that you can store in your head uh, if you're studying 24-7 for a whole year, OK? Um, and this axis here is logarithmic. So every time we go up by this much, the problem gets worse by 10 times. So by the time we go from the bottom of the plot to the top of the plot, we made ourselves a bigger problem by 10,000 times, OK? And so you know, this would be sort of the amount that you could store in your head, uh, in everyone's heads on Earth in one year, right? And so at this point, the amount of information that we're generating all the way in the corner there per year would require 100 Earths full of humans studying this thing 24 seven and no one ever looking at the same data point once and keeping it all in your heads. This is just so that we could remember what it was, let alone to make sense of this. And you can see sort of this line is, is sloped this way, which means that, you know, in 2017, which is where we are right here, you know, it will take about a thousand Earths of people to make sense of the data that we have. And this problem is not going away anytime soon, right? So we have electronic health records. We have you know, the way that people interact with their cell phones. We are trying to use this to predict epidemics, right? We're trying to use this to predict you know, bad guys. We're using this sort of for a variety of reasons. And so the amount of data that is getting collected is not going down, it's going up. And so we need to make sense of this somehow. And clearly, if all we are trying to use is our heads, we're stuck here, right? And we need to be here. So there's sort of 10,000 times of sort of problem if everyone was just trying to do this, right? So we have a big problem. And what we are going to do is we're at least going to try to use computers, right? So computers are becoming incredibly fast, incredibly cheap, incredibly pain plentiful. So we're going to turn to computer science um, to allow us to make better sense of our data. So I specifically like to look at data. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by that. Uh, we're going to be creating pictures that somehow let us make sense of what is going on. So instead of looking at just numbers, we're going to make images. And we're going to use these images to make sense of the sources of data. And it turns out this is extremely powerful. And we're going to be looking at a lot of examples of that. So 
why do we actually want to look at data at all, right? So the data in the computer is the data that we have in our actuary tables. They're all sort of tabular data, right? So in the, if you've played with an Excel spreadsheet, you know sort of what this looks like. We have a lot of rows and we have numbers in them, right? So let me try to convince you that looking at tables is a bad idea and you should be looking at plots and charts instead. So what I have here are four very, very simple uh, data sets, right? So you can imagine this is sort of four possible worlds, right? And we'd like to, you know, know in which one we are. So can you all hear me if I speak to you like this? Great. So there are 11 points, right? So sort of there's 11 different data points. Think of it as being a company that has 11 people and they all have you know, some salary and some performance, right? Some number that says how good they are. And we'd like to make sense of that somehow, right? So the first thing that you would imagine doing is just looking at this table of numbers that has somehow, you know, the salary that they are making and the performance. And we have this for, you know, one case, we have this for another case, and this for a different case, and so on. So in total, we have 44 values, right? which doesn't seem like a lot, right? We would imagine that, you know, it doesn't seem like this is too much and we should be able to make sense of this, right? So this, I could leave you with this slide for 10 minutes and ask you to sort of try to figure it out. Um, but we have computers, right? So one of the things that we can do is we can tell our computers, please summarize this data, right? Try to tell me what are the important things about it. <laughs> And so the things that you can get are things like, what is the average, right? So what is the average of, say, the salary or the performance, right? So you can say, what is the minimum value? What is the maximum value? And you can get these numbers that will try to let you make sense of this. And what you will notice is that for all of these data sets that I showed you, the average, which is the mean, is exactly the same, right? So for all four values, they have exactly the same mean. And the same thing for the other column nine and seven and a half. So they look like they're kind of the same, All right? So you can go in and ask, well, maybe there's more to it than just the mean. Maybe, you know, let's look at how different and how they vary. So you can actually ask for things like the variability and then, you know, the minimum and the maximum look pretty close to one another as well. And so you try to sort of, you know, get numbers that will tell you what this data set is about. You can say, for example, you know, as their, you know, salaries get bigger, you know, does their performance increase, right? So does the line that you would plot look this way? Does it look this way or does it look this way? And so again, we have computers to compute those. We can sort of just write the, the software to do this and the computer will tell you that line looks exactly the same. So, you know, these two numbers describe the line, the line looks exactly the same. And so if you're just trying to get numbers out of this, now you're pretty convinced, wow, these are really just the same thing. Right, you have the same slope, you have the same intercept, you have the same means. It turns out you have the same correlations, you have the same covariances. If you sort of a stats head, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, these are sort of fancy names for things that make that tell you something about the data. So if you are only sort of you know looking one number at a time, you might be convinced all of these numbers are coming out the same. Maybe this thing is all the same data set. Now you can make a picture. So these are the four different data sets. And now you don't need to know anything about statistics. You just need to use your eyes and common sense to see that these are all four completely different stories, right? So in one of them you have, so all of these, the blue line is the line that I told you about that shows one versus the other. And now you can see that these are all entirely different things that the numbers are in some sense not giving you anywhere near the whole story, right? The one on the top left is sort of what you'd expect if you're thinking about fitting a line through it. There's some noise, but this looks okay. This one says that the model you chose to fit is not good, right? We fit, we fit a line, but if we had fit a curve instead, this would be very nice. But turns out that by just looking at the errors and just looking at the means or something, we were fundamentally unable to distinguish between this one and this one. And the same thing happens for the bottom, right? So these are all four entirely different worlds. If you want to understand what's happening with your company, you'd better know which one of these four you're living in. And the individual numbers that I showed you before do not tell you anywhere near the whole story. You make a very simple picture 
and now you do know, okay? So this is a very, very simple example, right? So as I said, there's 11 points in each one of these and there's only four different possibilities. So, you know, if our life is already complicated and we need to sort of use visualization to make sense of data sets with 11 points, imagine trying to make sense of 1 billion, okay? And I'm using 1 billion here, not flippantly as in billions and billions like Carl Sagan would say, uh, I'm saying 1 billion because this project actually started in collaboration with, oops, uh, in collaboration with uh, friends at at and where I used to work before I came to, to the U of A. And there we were trying to make sense of the phone calls that happened on the network. at and had at the point about 130 million active cell phones and they made about 10 calls a day. So that's 1 billion and change calls every day on the network that you need to make sense of. You know, are these calls dropping because the towers are overloaded or because the phones are not working well? Are people trying to steal service? Um, what are the trends happening? And so we need to make sense of those. And it's one billion of something new coming in every day. And we need to make sense of this. So the things I'm going to tell you about the technology that I've been helping build uh, in collaboration with at and Research and with my students at the Department of Computer Science came from this necessity of having to make sense of these massive sources of data uh, for which just looking at numbers is not enough. We actually need charts and pictures to interact with. So um, how many of you have learned of machine learning and data mining? Great. So um, this is um, a set of sort of techniques and programs and things that people have been doing with data where they're trying to teach computers to predict what's happening from the data, right? So we're trying to teach computers to learn from the data sets and sort of to make sense of big data by themselves. And it is tremendously exciting and tremendously impactful. We have things like language translators that mostly work today. We have sort of uh, computers that are capable of understanding speech. All of these are fantastic things. Um, but what they, uh, the industry will not tell you, and I'm here to tell you, is that there's a huge amount of human labor involved in machine learning, which is deciding what models to pick. It's essentially, you know, figuring out which one of these four worlds we live in. And computers are essentially unable to do that. And so uh, one of the really exciting things that we've been doing is using the techniques that I'm going to talk about to you about to make sense of machine learning. We think that the world is best served by letting computers do what they do best and letting humans do what they do best, which is to make sense of the patterns that exist in the data. So, you know, the punchline of this is that we sort of fundamentally believe that, you know, as computers and computational techniques and, you know, new things we can do with the data get better, we kind of want to make sure that humans know what's happening underneath it, right? So machine learning is very, very powerful, but we want to make sure that we know what's going on in there as well. And data visualization is tremendously powerful for that. So um, let me give you a brief demo of the types of things that we're working on. So as I said, it started uh, with a collaboration with uh, colleagues of mine from at and Research in New York. And this is a technique we call nanocubes, but let me just show you pictures because this makes a lot more sense. So this was a paper um, and a system that we've been developing for a few years now. And the types of things that it will let us do are, for example, making pictures that tell you stories that are interesting about these very, very large sources of data. So on the top there, um, what we have are two maps where what we're recording are calls that happen on the network and the devices that are making the calls. And so just from uh, a very high level perspective, if we look at the places where we see sort of darker colors, we know there's more people in there, right? And so this is not too surprising. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that we can make this work on your phone, right? So we can have a phone or we can have a laptop make this picture and this picture is being made out of tens of billions of data points. Uh, the other interesting thing here is that there's two colors associated with this, right? So you can see the parts in blue and you can see the parts in red, okay? And we created this data set by essentially just recording the type of device that people are using. So at that point, there were two sort of big types of cell phones that people use. There were the Apples and there were the Androids, right? So these are just two different devices. And the more popular a device is, the more 
that plot tends to a specific color, okay? And so we can see that something is interesting is happening here, right? Sort of a priori, like sort of before anything else, you, there's no reason to believe that any one device should be more popular in an area than another one, right? Why would that happen? Although if you look at it, there's a big part in which blue is much more predominant than red, right? And so anyone want to take a guess as what that could possibly be? Price, right? One of them costs five times as much as the other, and so people that can afford to do. And so we in a, inadvertently created a map of income levels in the United States, right? Um, it's it's true. Um, the the behind the scenes story is that we the lawyers wouldn't let us tell everyone else what this map was for, um, because this was at the time where app or AT and T had the exclusive contract with iPhones, and they didn't want to sort of do those kinds of things, but the pattern is actually quite striking. So this is a zoom in of the Chicago uh, metropolitan area. And so if you know Chicago, you know very clearly what we're plotting here, is sort of like the rich areas versus the less well-off areas, right? Um, and we saw this sort of replicated throughout the whole United States. And so one of the interesting things that you see with these large data sets is that um, a lot of uh, the different, you sort of cannot escape social economics, right? So, you know, if you're collecting data about people and making sense of it, sort of these things kind of uh, shine through the data that you generate. And so we could see things like people trying to, uh, you know, the fraud or network where the software updates went wrong, all the things that we were interested about. But we could also see things that we, we didn't expect and that, you know, people hadn't realized they could actually, you know, predict. And so one of the reasons these are interesting is that for example, if at that time there were places that would give you the data for free. And so you could go to a company like Twitter and you could just say, hey, you know, just show me every single tweet that people are geolocating, that they tell you exactly where they are when they said they are 140 characters of wisdom. And yes, <laughs> let's go with wisdom. Uh, and they would just give you this data for free. And so inadvertently, you could look at this, you could sort of make these maps and get an idea for an income map for the United States kind of, you know, just from them. And so you can imagine that there's a lot of value that we can get from this data and a lot of sort of risky, complicated things as well. But it's very exciting that we can do this. And so let me just show you a little bit of this sort of live and in action. Um, so I'm gonna switch from the slides to a website and so one of the really exciting things about this thing that we're building is that it lets you, you know, find uh, interesting patterns on large data sets and lets you explore them sort of on a website. So you can do this on a cell phone. And the example here that we're going to show is actually not from the Twitter data set because they don't let us use that anymore. Twitter changed their terms of service. The lawyers got unhappy. And so I'm going to show you a slightly smaller data set for now. But this is a social network that used to exist in the early 2010, sort of circa 2009, 2010. So there's 5 million data points here. 5 million is a lot. And one of the things that we want to be able to do, uh, for example, I'm going to click on select here, and I'm going to draw a big rectangle around the United States. Okay? So, and the moment that I click here, you saw that the interface changed, right? So I'm going to click on Europe instead, and you're going to see that the interface changed, right? And so even though there's 4 million data points, you know, and this is sitting in some server somewhere in New Jersey, the moment I click go, it sort of makes this query into the system and instantly gets you a picture back that sort of says, you know, where are the popular times in which people have? So this is sort of a plot that says the larger the bar, the more popular, you know, more often people will sort of check in or post updates or something like that, right? We can split this by days of the week. So people like to do more things more on Friday and Saturday than they do on the other days and by hour. And we can also do this, you know, in terms of showing both the time of day and the day of the week. So let me just explain a little bit about what's going on in that plot. So in here, the brighter the square, the more activity there is. Right? And so this is where everyone is leaving. And so the first thing we can see right away, people sleep later on the weekend. Right? So it's just there. So you can see that you know either they sleep or they don't want to talk about what they're doing on the website. But it's very obvious that they do that. And so we can get all sorts of interesting patterns with this, right? So my favorite story about this data set is 
you know, if I look at this, we can see a little bit of this sort of late weekend activity here, but the difference between the weekdays and the weekends is not very pronounced. People like to use this during work, okay? Now, let's look at Japan. And let's look at this again. And do you see how striking the difference is? Right, so the big bright area here is only on the weekends. And by the way, people don't sleep later in Japan. There is no big gap, right? So let's compare this again to the United States, right? And so these are all patterns that, you know, just come from the way that people in different cultures use these tools differently or, you know, the way that they are different. But it's very fascinating to me that, you know, if we build the right computer science to be able to quickly ask these questions where we wonder, you know, what is the activity like in the US versus what is the activity like in Europe versus what is the activity like in Japan, we get very different. And now this thing got a little slow. There we go. Uh, in Japan, and very interestingly, you go in India and you get a very different uh, up and so I believe this says more about access to technology than anything else. And so, you know, let's be careful about jumping to conclusions, but the patterns are all by themselves very interesting and very starkly different from one another. And so one of the really fascinating things about this idea of big data is that we get to learn things about um, the world that we didn't even expect were possible from what we were collecting. And so I think this is very exciting. Um, so, let me tell you a little bit about what happens behind the scenes here, All right? So, um, as I said, this requires, um, you know, sort of novel computer science, right? So this is what I do as a researcher. You know, I have a group of four PhD students working with me, and we're all sort of trying to develop like the novel algorithms and the way that we are going to organize the data in the computer so that we can do these things fast enough, right? And so let me just give you sort of a little bit of a taste of what uh, that looks like. So. One of the things that we want to make sure here are sort of what are the design goals for this, right? What are the ways that, you know, we need this to do, right? What are the prerequisites, right? So the first one is we're interested in exploration, right? So you saw me clicking around with no big aim, right? I didn't really know ahead of time what were the things that we're hoping to find on the data set. And so we want to make sure that this supports many different possible queries, right? I do not want to say there are four things I can ask about the data, because if I do that, then I'm back at the original problem where I'm picking four numbers and only showing you that, right? I actually want to be able to ask many different questions from my, the pictures that I'm going to make. At the same time, I don't want to have to pre-compute every one of those because that's just going to take a whole lot of memory, right? That's just going to blow up exponentially, if you've heard the term, right? Which roughly means that for every new point that I add, it's kind of going to double the amount of memory that I need. And if I'm not careful, this exceed the number of atoms in the universe very fast. And I don't want to do that. You know, I'd rather use them for something else. Uh, and I kind of want to be, you know, uh, I don't want to get bored and sort of, you know, my patience run out before I wait for the answer to happen, right? So one of the things that is really uh, interesting from a psychology point of view is we've learned recently in the last 15 years that um, the ability to get an answer back from the computer very quickly fundamentally changes the way that people interact with the computer. So uh, some, this is not work that I've done. This is work that I think is fascinating. Uh, I wish I'd done it. <laughs> but they've uh, run these experiments where they had a piece of, you know, a program just like what I showed you. And they did it with half of the people. They showed the result right away. And then with half of the people, they waited one second. It's not a minute. It's not an hour. It was one second before giving the answer and they asked them try to solve this problem using data visualization and data exploration. And what they found is that 0.5 seconds, it's even less than one second, is enough for people to work so differently that they couldn't find the solutions for what they were looking at. And so even though one second seems like rationally, it would be something that if you know that's all it's going to take, you just take a deep breath, you wait for it, you click, count to one, and you see the result and you keep going. But there's something very deep in the psychology of sort of how people work that if they think the computer is taking longer than just, you know, fraction of a second, 
they fundamentally change the way that they explore the data. And so if we want to build interfaces that let people figure things out about these massive data sources that we have, we kind of need this to be fast, right? We need this to be answering essentially under half a second. And so this is kind of a hard um, constraint on our problem set. And so that's where the interest in computer science comes from, right? So to give a few examples of the types of things we want to be able to show, right? As I just showed you, you know, I want to be able to produce a heat map of the whole world, but I also want to be able to sort of, you know, fix a certain amount of time and just show you the activity in 2005 so that I can say, did the world in 2005 look different than 2010 or 2009, right? So this involves showing the data as it varies geographically, right? But I also want to show the data as it varies across time, right? So if all I'm interested in are sort of how often people talk about something um, throughout time, then I want to be able to show a plot in which the higher the value goes, the more popular, the more people are talking about this. And I want to show variation throughout time instead of showing it throughout space. And so this is a different kind of query that this needs to be doing, right? And not only that, but I want to be able to, you know, show things like I want to know what this plot looks like if I focus on, say, Central Texas, right? And so it turns out there was a big, famous tech conference, uh, South by Southwest, that used to happen uh, in Texas. And so if you select sort of Central South Texas, you get this big spike there. This is sort of showing the week in March in which that conference happened. And it's very obvious that there's something fundamentally different in here. And so this right away would tell you, hmm, let's go figure this out, right? And so I need to be able to support all these different questions that you don't really know ahead of time are going to be asked, right? And so the way that this works um, is not that complicated, but let me try to sort of explain and give you a flavor for sort of the computer science that happens behind it, right? So, um, in this example, um, we have a much smaller data set. So there's only five rows, OK? So imagine you work at a car dealership, and you want to do these kinds of plots where you want to understand what are the brands of cars that are getting sold, what are the types of cars, you know, are they sedans, are they automatic transmissions, are they manuals? And so sort of your data set is a list of sales that has the make of the car, it has the size of the car, and it has other things like the transmission, it might have like the displacement, the size of the engine, and those kinds of things, right? So this is your raw data, right? So one of the ways that you could do this is every time there's a new question uh, that the system asks, you write the, you make the computer go over every one of these and, you know, say, does this count? Does this count? Does this count? Does this count? Line by line by line on your data set, right? This works. But remember that we might be talking about data sets that are very large, right? We might be talking about data sets that are in the billions, right? And on a data set that has one billion element, if you take one nanosecond, which is about as fast as computers will operate at one row of data, that still takes one second, right? And we know that one second is too long. And so we can't simply take the data as it's raw and go row by row asking the question. That's not going to cut it. Right? We need to do something with it in order to be able to answer those things faster. And so a few years ago, a very famous computer scientist uh, invented this idea of a data queue. And the idea here is instead of taking this table of the data that we created, we make a slightly different table. So we say for every one of these uh, values, we're going to add an extra value that's done noting here by an asterisk. And this just means all. It just means I don't care about this, right? I don't want to you know, restrict myself. And I add an extra column which says how many of these are actually of that particular value. And then, so for example, what we would have here is this line means how many cards do I have that are both <laughs> and end? And then I, right? And so if you go here, there is one card that is a manual SUV. And so there's only one. So the value here is But if I just want to know how many cars did I sell, and so I don't care about the make, I don't care about the style or the transmission, that's the first row all the way on the top. So it's star, 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 that says I don't care. And there's five of them, right? And so what we have is a way to Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. All right. <laughs> so in this table, we don't need to go over every one of these rows to get the total count. We can just go look and say, give me the one that says all, all, all. There's five of them. Right? If you ask the question, how many cars did I sell that are automatics? That's the second row there. There's a star, there's a star, then there's an auto, and there's three of them. So at that table, I do not need to go search for each one of these. Right? And so if I have a way to compute the table on the right from the table on the left, then I can answer these questions very fast. And that's sort of the underlying magic that we've developed is a way to build a table on the right that is small enough that it will fit on the computers for the types of data that we have. Um, I'm happy to talk about the details of the actual data structure if you're interested, but this gives you the flavor of the types of tricks that we have to sort of teach a computer to do in order to be able to do these things quickly enough. And you know, for those of you who are interested in these, um, one of the interesting things here is that, so for example, for the data set that I was telling you about with Twitter, we have 210 million rows, and this takes about 46 gigabytes of memory to create. So this table in the right here, which is the one that lets us do things fast, takes a lot of memory, right? So the original data set had about 210 million elements. We ended up with sort of 46 gigabytes, so it's quite a bit. Um, the good news is after we are done with this, the queries that we're interested in, they're essentially dominated by network, right? So this can sit in a data center somewhere, right? In this case, the demos that I was showing to you, this data is literally sitting somewhere in New Jersey. And we can make the queries sort of about as fast as we can make the Wi-Fi go. So that's great. Then the next question is, I like to use my hands. <laughs> You know, is 46 is an awfully large number, right? Is this practical? Does this make sense? Do we want to spend the money to go from a much smaller set of data to a much bigger one? Is this worth doing, right? And so here I'm here to tell you that yes, it's worth doing. And I'm here to also tell you that um, the last 50 years, we've seen something really incredible happen with storage in a computer. So. This is a plot um, that is, again, in the logarithmic scale. And this is the price of storage for computers. And so um, I'm just going to speak loudly. I like my hands. So. <laughs> 1960s was about when we started having commercially available computers. So you can go to some store and buy computers and buy the parts to make the computers that you wanted. And in 1957, if you want to get one megabyte, so enough to store one million words that are between 1 and 256, um, you have to pay $400 million. So $400 million for a megabyte was the going price in 1957 for main memory for your computer. Okay? So if you buy in 1957 a computer that had 256 bytes, you were rich. No, this was sort of like you were you were showing that to your friend. It was great. Um, so not very many people could buy a megabyte. <laughs> and this is not uh, just for inflation. So if you look at this, these are in the dollar amounts of their respective years. So if this was 2016 years, this is even more. Today, in main memory, one megabyte costs a third of a cent. Okay. So uh, if you're keeping count, that is 10, 100, 1,000, that is 100 million times cheaper. That's staggering. In 50 years, we brought down the cost of storage by 100 million. Okay. So not only are our computers incredibly fast, but they can store absurd amounts of information. And so even though we can if we want to pre-process our data sets to make uh, interactive visualization possible, it is still tremendously cheap to do so. Uh, it's still very practical. And so one of the things that we want to do is we want to create computer science that sort of adapts to how humans think, right? So if humans like 
uh, because of psychology reasons, because of sort of the way that our brains work, if they like their queries to be answered fast, and memory is cheap, we should be doing this, right? We can afford the extra costs in memory to be able to do the computer science that will let humans make sense of data in the way that the humans do it. And so this is sort of an important lesson, right? We are now at such an abundant uh, part of computer science and engineering that we can afford to make our computers work the way that we do rather than the other way around. And I think we should do that. So this is something that we've spent some time in our lab trying to uh, get going as, you know, computers should not, we should not be doing things in the way that computers want us to do. It should be the other way around. And so this is just an economic reason for why we kind of get away with doing this. So let me just show you uh, another data set. And this is from a paper that my graduate student published just last year. Uh, where what we're going to do now is instead of just looking at how many check-ins, right? So how many times did someone say something at the Super Bowl stadium or you know at their local burger joint? What we want to look at now are sort of you know what if we actually start doing a little bit of statistics inside each one of these, right? What if we want to understand what's going on inside each one of these boxes? And specifically, uh, can we make sense of late flights? So, you know, we are all blessed to be here in Tucson in January when there's very rarely snow. Uh, I just came back from a research uh, trip to Salt Lake and I was Salt Lake City and I was blessed by five degree temperature and a foot and a half of snow, blessed. Uh, and so snow and winter and travel is really disruptive. Uh, and so one of the things that you end up sort of getting obsessed about when you're an academic are, you know, like, are all flights horrible? And some of them are, as I want to show you. So what we have here is another map, just like the one I showed you before. But now, uh, the first thing is the amount of data that we have is quite a bit more. So we have 163 million flights, right? So this is about 20 odd years of data from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics on uh, the performance of flights. So you can go on a website and you can download all of these that say this flight that happened in 1997 from Sioux Falls to Minneapolis was late seven minutes on departure and uh, early three minutes on arrival or something like that. All of this information is gathered historically and we can go and make sense of this. And one of the really fun things to do is that they actually tell you which airline it was. And so what we're doing here is we're trying to give each airline a grade that is sort of about how flights get late throughout the day, right? So in some sense, if you get a flight at sort of seven in the morning, there hasn't been enough time for like a snowball effect to make the next flight late, right? They haven't had the opportunity of having one late flight delay the departure of the next flight and so on and so forth. And what we want to measure is the snowball effect is this idea that, you know, as the day goes by, how much worse do things get, okay? And so the color in here and the length of this is essentially this grade. It's sort of the rate at which flights get later. And so the bigger this bar, the worse things get. And so one of the things that you can see here is, you know, the company that operated as ExpressJet is the worst one, sort of on average, their flights get delayed at a rate of 2%. That doesn't seem like a whole lot, right? But when you think about uh, the day has 24 hours, that means that on average, a flight from ExpressJet at the end of the day was late 24 times two is 48, half an hour. This is on average, right? This is over you know, their entire history of 3 million flights. And so when I click here, the other thing you can see is now, instead of looking using length, I'm using color here to depict this, right? So you can see that something very, very bad is happening at this airport, right? So imagine that the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, right? This is, you know, available on the web. Anyone can download it, right? You'd like to make sense of this, right? I would like to be able to go and say, you know, I'm going to fly out of O'Hare two weeks from now. What is the airline I should use, right? They will give me these weird numbers about performance. I don't know exactly what they mean. I want to be able to look at something like this and say, you know, if I'm flying Express Jet, I kind of would like to fly to O'Hare instead of flying to Newark, right? Because, hey, this is a lot easier to see than, you know, trying to go through all of those 
values, right? And so we can do this over all of them, right? We can look at, say, Virgin America, and you can see how the patterns change, right? So one of the really fascinating things is that it seems like every single airline has sort of one problem place, right? So Frontier, you know, it's sort of okay, actually, right? So we can look at US Airways, or at least what used to be US Airways. You can see that American is a very, actually quite good airline, right? Sort of compared to the other ones, right? And so, but even so, something is not great here. We can look at things like in the bottom here is sort of, instead of breaking it down by airline, we're breaking down by time of the year. And so we can see these spikes are sort of the winter storms that, you know, knock down sort of big parts of the country. And this is when things are okay, right? So you can see this is things going bad and something went really bad here, right? Now, let me show you something that might indicate of you. This is Southwest, right? Remember I told you about, look, problems here, problems in one airport, problems in one airport, problems in every airport. Uh, let's look at 2014, right? Let's look at 2014 around here, okay? So now we're looking at a number that is 0 0.25, 0 0.025. Um, there are instances in here in which flights from Southwest, they become um, late at a rate of 5% on average on an airport. That means that at the end of the day, on average, you are looking at a two hour, one hour delay, one hour and change. Um, so we thought that you know this was a bug in our code, uh, that there's no way this can go this bad. And then we, I'm gonna skip a little bit of this. No one looks and likes math, but we like pictures. We looked at Southwest and we were shocked. We said, there's no way this is a bug in our code. Uh, and we found this in early 2014. I don't know as it were, if you remember what happened in 2014. Um, we decided to look it up. I wasn't flying at the time. Um, Turns out Southwest had implemented a new way of scheduling their planes and it didn't work very well. And uh, what they decided to do in order to not cancel flights was to say, well, we're actually just going to delay the flights on the tarmac. And instead of canceling the flight, which triggers all sorts of weird rules with the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, they just let people you know, hang out to dry on the tarmac. And so uh, you read stories that in 2014, they had flights that you know, were two hour flights and they were eight hours delayed waiting on the runway, flights running out of water. Um, it, it's, it's really harrowing and they got fined for this. They actually got fined sort of the biggest possible, like fine so far, it was like million dollars over what they did at Midway. Uh, which is both ridiculous. I mean, you do this and you get fined $1.6 million. That's what, a thousand tickets? Come on. Uh, but also really fascinating that we can get this really interesting piece of information that we can see a sort of complete breakdown of the performance of one airline from a very clear picture, right? So, you know, this is sort of the worst that happened in 25 years and we could see it right away just because the whole map turned red. And so I think it's really fascinating that as my grad students and I were looking at this, we weren't really expecting to find any sort of dramatic instances of this. And it took us three minutes of playing around with the data. And so I wonder how much more insights are sort of hidden away in the databases of the world because people choose to show things sort of one number at a time rather than one picture at a time. So that's um, about sort of my story of the day for you. So I think that interactive visualization is a really powerful way to make sense of what's going on in the world. and you know, if you sort of are careful about the computer science and you're mindful of the fact that computers are incredibly fast and incredibly cheap, uh, we can now do this in a way that makes sense for people. And we can make these pictures that I think are actually quite beautiful too. And so, you know, we can make these images that are nice, they are pleasurable to interact with, and they let us make sense of data. I think this is a really nice confluence of what happens in computer science and what happens in sort of psychology. So. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the chance to do this. And if you're interested about this sort of stuff, uh, you can come talk to me afterwards or you can just go visit the webpage of our research group or on my personal page. There's links to all these demos and all those things. So thank you very much again.
All righty, we're going to do some question and answers for the next 15 to 20 minutes. And as usual, Darby will be on the far side, Darby or CJ, and I will be on this side. So if you have any question, any questions, we are here. Oh, that was fast. All right. So is your group writing uh, clever filters, or are you writing programs that go through data faster yeah, so because of some clever way where you exactly uh yeah that's right so so it's the, it's the latter so um you know what i was telling you about sort of the way to structure these data sets um what, through these appropriate like these data cubes um the the work that myself and the grad student and my collaborators at hng we've been developing the computer software so we actually have sort of c plus plus code if you care um that so we have the the, the system that sort of takes in all that data pre-processes it and makes it in such a way that after you have that, it will let you build the visualizations very fast. So uh, we go from like the raw data that's living somewhere, either on you know uh, files in a disk or in a database that's not ready for these queries. We process all of it, and by the time it's done, we have a different program that can query against it very quickly and make the pictures. So um, this requires you mentioned filters. We have filters that work on top of it. But it, we also need to build the actual software that happens, you know, that happens to sort of like combine the right pieces of the data in the right way and put them in the right place in memory so things get fast enough. So that's kind of what our research is trying to do. I noticed that uh, on your map of the world, you had the United States, Europe, and Japan as heavy users. Mm -hmm. This one? Yes. Oops. Why? What's the deal with Russia and China? <laughs> um, so um, this is uh, not passively uh, captured, right? So this is not, you know, just data that happens to be from people, right? They have to go actively use this particular website that existed, and we can I can zoom in a little bit. So this existed from, you know, somewhere in 2008 to late 2010. And then they went under. Um, you know, it was some startup company that didn't make enough money, and then it crashed and burned. It just didn't make it in Russia and in China and in Brazil, for that matter, right? So this is, um, if you look at the map, this is not a map of population density, right? You know, it's missing big areas here, right? So this is an artifact of the data in some sense, right? So as I mentioned, you know, you. Um, when you're capturing all these things, you learn, you, you end up getting more than what you wanted. And in the same sense, you get, you get less than what you wanted as well, right? So if you're looking for data that is uh, comprehensive about the whole world, you have to make sure that, you know, people are sort of feeding into it. And this was never the goal of the company. And so we simply don't have the information on, you know, Russia or anywhere in the Middle East or in South America because no one was using that particular app, right? And so that, that's just what, what happened. There's no... Uh, other reason besides that. So. Oh, I see you. Hold on oh, one second. She missed you. That's better. Thank you. Now I can see you. So I noticed that most of the data is categorical that you're demonstrating here? What do you do with the real data, do you, real numbers? Are you binning it uh, in advance? Or? Okay, uh, a fellow nerd, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we support both categorical. So um, just um, data needs to be um, fixed point. So uh, we don't support arbitrary real valued or floating point at this point. It needs to be fixed point. But uh, you get to give the resolution that you want to. And so, yes, this data here is categorical. And so for the people that are not data geeks, Categorical just means uh, different values. There's no numbers attached to this, right? So it's, you know, Express Jet, Southwest, American. They're categories, right? They're not values. It's not that, you know, American is worth one, United is worth two, Southwest is. They're just different categories, right? So you're correct. We support categorical data. Right? We also support uh, time data, right? So in the bottom here, right, all these events have time associated with them, which is just some number, right? It's just saying, you know, this this time, and then one day after, and then one day after. So we support those. And we also support spatial data, right? So uh, data that lives in a two-dimensional uh, square, right? So um, in fact, the 
technical innovation that we brought when we published this paper uh, was the idea that we supported all of these at the same time um, and we could do queries on if we wanted to do a spatial query we could if we wanted to do a categorical data query we could if we wanted to do both of them at the same time we could and we could mix this with the numerical data as well so um, it doesn't support as you said arbitrary real values but if you picked some resolution that you're willing to work with um, then we support that. Of course, the higher the resolution, the more memory it takes, and so there's a trade-off there. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay, thank you. It's a great question. Hi. Um, as the amount of data grows exponentially and you run into the issues of trying to analyze that, you also run into the issues, I would think, of error identification and error correction. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you look at to, or what you have done to address that. It's an excellent question. Um, so there's no there's no easy way um, to do that. Uh, so the question is, you know, what if there's a mistake in the data, right? So you know, what are the sources of error? What happens when things go bad? Um, there's one of the real advantages of doing data visualization versus just doing sort of plain statistics and machine learning is that humans tend to be better at spotting things that look off. They look sort of strange somehow. Uh, then machines that just tend to, you know, assume this is just some strange value. I'm going to process it as if it were all of the regular values, and then sort of bad things happen with the processing. All right. So all the way back in the beginning of the talk, let me just go back here. Right. So you mentioned errors in the data, right? So one of the really striking things about this this example that I showed you is that in the bottom, you can think of this as having, you know, two bad values here. Right, so you can think of this as your data that really should be just like this straight line here, nothing else. And then something really strange happens with this error that the data set is, you know, but it's usually sort of called an outlier, right? It's sort of like this bad thing that is like the black swan that you never really expected to get. And um, computers are typically very bad or not nearly good enough at detecting that that thing is an outlier. So visualization and sort of the ability to make pictures of this it's uh, a lot more powerful to sort of try to figure out what's going on in there and sort of, you know, at least be able to show to you something strange is happening with these two, right? That point there it shouldn't really be like that, and neither should be this one. And so that would give you a hint of where to go next. But in reality, there is no easy question, uh, no easy answer to your question. It's definitely the uh, the ugly secret of people who do work in data is, you know, people call themselves data scientists, and really the true term should be sort of data janitor. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're really a data custodian. You have to be working on this and sort of cleaning it up and making sure that, you know, there's nothing bad, sort of like just making, uh, keeping the house clean. And it takes, um, people have written tons of papers about this because it really is a huge drain in terms of resources. It takes anywhere between 80 and 90% of the total time of the people that work in the field just figuring out where the bad stuff happens. And so visualization is a really powerful way to do this, but it's still very much a manual process. So it's an excellent question. It's very much an active research area. So, Sir, yes. uh, the, the, the four patterns that you have there seem to me to be very, very amenable to pattern recognition. And the AI work that was done in pattern recognition back in the 80s and 90s. Um, the other thing I want to know is, uh, in that processing of data, one of the huge problems is what kind of questions do you ask? Because the query, what kind of question you ask, really defines sort of the answer you get. So it's sort of a double question. Yes. Um, so, uh, so the first question was, is pattern recognition uh, right here? And um, the answer is uh, yes, but not in the way that we would like to be yes. So it is yes only if, uh, in a sense, after the fact. After, so there's, you, you have to define a class of patterns that essentially defines what are the things that you can detect. And then after the fact, you can run this and say, oh, yes, it will detect the pattern. So once you know that the patterns are noise like that, a quadratic curve, an outlier in this way, an outlier in the other way, then you can write the pattern recognition and the pattern matching to do that. But before you know that, you can't. And so this is sort of a no lunch, no free lunch theorem where people have proven things about the fact that 
you know, if there's nothing to be done about this, there's a limit to how well we can do this automatically. And so your answer is yes, absolutely. Once you know what you're looking for, you write the computer code to do it. The problem is that we don't know what we're looking for yet. Right? And so this is where we're trying to come in. Right? So this is sort of what I alluded to in terms of the machine learning part, right? Is that once you have the pattern recognition, fantastic, let's use this. But uh, defining exactly what you want to show the computer and how is very much the complicated question, which is in some sense what you said after the second question was, make these plots quickly and visually? Can we automatically find the ones that are interesting? You know, did we need to click around in order to figure out that Southwest was doing this uh, thing? And so people are working on that, sort of trying to figure out what are the anomalies that exist in your data after you pre-process it. It is not my area of expertise, but there's certainly, it's very much a research area. And the types of methods that people end up researching look very much like what you suggested. You know, you build what you believe are the typical examples using a neural net, and then you sort of use this neural network to try to show new examples and have it say, this is interesting, this is weird, this is what I expected it to be. So um, more of that on the upcoming talk from the Antares project. So if you're interested in sort of doing those things, uh, there's a project coming up February 9. Look at that. Um, I, I'm involved in that project too. So uh, where they're using um, data mining and machine learning uh, to make sense of telescope data that's going to go online. And sort of, you need a combination of humans looking at this and machine learning methods. So you're absolutely right. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, found one. What airline do you use? <laughs> uh, I, I used to fly uh, Continental because I was working in New Jersey for AT&T, 